Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Funding Your Child's Therapy. Our webinar tonight is co-hosted by Morna Chappelle and Compass, who is a partner of the Government of Canada. My name is Natalie Elms, and I work for Morna Chappelle's Children's Support Solutions. I'm happy to be the moderator for this evening's webinar. As a behavior therapist and family advocate, I'm often asked di about different funding resources that families can access. Funding is always a challenge for families, and I'm really excited to learn more about the Registered Disability Savings Plan tonight. So tonight's discussion is important. We know that children with special needs have medical, emotional, developmental, and behavior challenges that require ongoing help and support. There's a number of ways that provincial, federal, and charitable programs help families and caregivers of children with differences. And we wanna share some of these with you tonight. We're so happy to have all of you join us and we wanted to extend an offer to you that we're waiving our registration fee for anyone who's registered for the funding webinar. All you need to do is when you contact Children's Support Solutions by phone or email or the self-referral form is mention the funding webinar and we'll waive the $65 registration fee. It's our thank you for joining us tonight. Before we get started, I wanted to share with you a little bit about what Morna Chappelle's Children's Support Solutions does. Children's Support Solutions works with family, schools, and child care centers to identify children's needs and to help them reach their potential. We work with infants through young adults of all abilities, and we believe every child is unique, and understanding that uniqueness is what we do best. We provide a large range of services, including screening and assessments, group programs, and solutions for schools and daycares that includes professional development. Our, our services are family-centered and interprofessional, which means that we always start with the question, what will work for this child and what's right for this family? We think about the mix of services that will help the child and help get the parents booked for the next best step to support their child reaching their potential. In an integrated model, our professionals are not just under one roof, but they actually plan together and train together and work together on a child's file to provide an integrated approach. Our therapists and educators are trained and certified in a wide range of disciplines, which includes the listing on the left, which would be clinical psychology, speech language pathology, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, behavior therapy, music therapy, special education, psychoeducation, guidance counseling, and tutoring. So that's a long list. We have 13 locations across Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia, and we're happy to offer services online now for families as well. Online, we have psychology and speech therapy available in Quebec and Ontario for right now, and longer term, we'd like to roll that out nationally. Joining us tonight from Compass Research, we have Kate Harrison. Just a reminder, Compass is a partner of the Government of Canada. They create disability-focused research and educate Canadians about the Registered Disability Savings Plan. At the end of the presentation, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. If you look at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you can submit questions to all panelists. We'll be answering questions via the messaging function, as well as Kate will be answering your questions live. And any questions about Children's Support Solutions, I'm happy to answer live as well. So what will Compass be sharing with us tonight? They're going to be giving us a better understanding of RDSP and potential government contributions. They're going to be sharing the latest updates and changes to the Registered Disability Savings Plan and some tips and advice on free resources that can be consulted for additional information. We know that navigating the healthcare system can be overwhelming and we want to help. Families can find links to these charities and government websites, as well as many others, on our website, which is childrensupportsolutions.com. There are also a number of organizations that will provide charitable funding to families. We've listed three popular ones that we work with often on here. One is Easter Seals, and if you happen to have a child who is in diapers, they do have an incontinence fund that families can access, which I know we have a lot of families that use that fund. We also work really closely with both President's Choice Children's Charity and Jennifer Ashley 
information on all three of these charitable resources can be found on our website and President's Choice Children's Charity and Jennifer Ashley Foundation both will fund therapy. President's Choice will fund between five and 10,000 for families whose income is under 70,000 and they have a formal diagnosis that qualifies. And Jennifer Ashley Children's Charity will fund up to around $2,000. At this point, I just want to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website for you to reference along with the resources that we're discussing. Now I'll pass things over to Kate to share more with you about the Registered Disability Savings Plan. Hi, Kate. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kate Harrison. I'm from Compass Research. Um, and this is my uh, personal first webinar, so uh, I appreciate all of your patience. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of background information about Compass, and then we will start talking about the RDSP. Um, so we are a uh, market research firm, and we've been working with the Government of Canada since um, 2008 when the RDSP started. And there's actually three purposes uh, for these sessions that we do all across the country. The first purpose is to share the information about the RDSP and get it out to eligible Canadian citizens. The second purpose is to assist you one-on-one um, -on -one if need be um, in the process of opening an RDSP. And the third purpose is to uh, receive feedback from you. We work very closely um, with the government to develop this program and improve it. Um, and we know it is still in the early stages, so it is by no means um, perfect. So at the end of this session, um, We'll have opportunity to get some feedback from you. Um, as well, you'll have my contact information. So if you have any specific feedback you don't want to share with the group, um, we would love to hear it. And it definitely has an impact on the program. So with that being said, um, let's get started. So this is just an overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. OK, so beginning. Um, just some general information about the RDSP, um, as well as the grant and bond, which are very important components of the program. So uh, the RDSP is a long-term savings plan, um, and it is meant to help Canadians with disabilities, as well as their families, save for the future. So in order to be eligible for the RDSP, you must meet three criteria. The first is being under the age of 60. The second is being a Canadian resident. And the third is being eligible for the disability tax credit. So the disability tax credit, some of you may already be familiar with this term, um, as it is a credit many Canadians have, um, but they don't always necessarily realize that it is, uh, it confirms their eligibility to open the RDSP. So if you're not aware uh, or familiar with the DTC, it's a non-refundable credit, and it reduces the amount of income tax that an individual with a severe and prolonged uh, physical or mental disability may have to pay. So during these sessions, we like to stress um, that the disability tax credit is really your ticket into opening an RDSP. So before you can open an RDSP, you first need to be eligible for the disability tax credit. So speaking of, who is eligible for the disability tax credit? In order to prove your eligibility, you need to have a qualified practitioner certify that you have an impairment in mental or physical functions, which is both severe and prolonged. And it must affect at least one of these categories, either vision, your daily um, living or basic activities, or life-sustaining therapy. It could also be a combination of two or more. So the first portion of the RDSP that we're going to talk about is the Canada Disability Savings Bond. So this is a deposit that the government puts into your RDSP of up to $1,000 a year for low income and modest income Canadians, um, even if you don't make any contributions. So when people hear about the RDSP, they may think at this point in their life they can't afford to open a long-term savings plan. However, depending on their income, if they fall um, beneath the uh, 
low income, then the government's going to deposit money no matter if you're contributing or not. So there is a lifetime limit of the bond um, of $20,000, and the government's going to pay them until you turn 49 years of age. So this slide is giving you a little overview um, of the income ranges that qualify for the bond. As you can see, um, if your annual income is $25,356 or less, you'll receive the full $1,000 annually. If you fall between $25,356 and $43,561, you'll be receiving a portion of the $1,000, and it's based on a formula um, in the Canada Disability Savings Act. However, if you do make more than $43,561, you're not eligible for the bond but you will be eligible for the grant, which is what we're going to talk about now. So the grant um, is a matching amount the government pays up to 300%, depending on how much you're personally contributing to the RDSD. It's also dependent on the family's income. So there is a maximum of 3,500 each year and a lifetime limit of 70,000. And same with the bond, the grants are paid into the RDSP until the age of 49. So this slide will give you an overview of income for the grant. Um, as you can see, everybody is eligible for the grant, but your income is going to determine if they're going to triple it, double it, or match your contribution. So just going to clarify some terms that will be used um, for the rest of the presentation. The first is family income. So this is the amount of the grant or bond for which a beneficiary qualifies. Um, it's dependent upon the family income. So until the beneficiary is 18 years of age, the family income is based on the income information that was used to determine the Canada Child Tax Benefit. So in other words, it's their family's, their parents' income. However, the beginning of the year um, that the beneficiary turns 19 years of age, it is now based off of their own personal income. And it's very important to make note of this because some people will not qualify for the bond or a larger portion of the grant when they're under their family income, but when it turns to their personal income and they're young and just starting out um, financially, then they could now qualify, in which case you need to notify the bank of the switch in income, and then you'll receive your, um, your bonds that you haven't been receiving previously. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, um, one of the purposes of these sessions is to receive feedback, and a few changes have been made recently for the RDSP as a result of the feedback that we've received from participants just like you. So one of those is the new carry forward option. So this allows beneficiaries to claim unused grant and bond entitlements for a 10 year period, starting from 2008, which is when the RDSP became available. However, as we proceed into the future, it's going to range a 10 year period. So as people with disabilities may not be able to contribute regularly to their RDSPs, this is why the carry forward option is um, in place. Okay, so part two, we're going to talk about how you're going to open an RDSP. And there are seven steps in the process. So we're going to go through each one uh, briefly, and then we'll do a nice overview um, of the whole process. So the first is identifying the beneficiary. So this is the person that's going to be receiving and benefiting from the money in the long term. So as mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, they must be under the age of 60, be a Canadian resident, be eligible for the disability tax credit, and have a social insurance number. So identifying the holder. So this is the person who can open and manage the RDSP. If the beneficiary is under the age of the majority, the holder can be a legal parent, a legal representative, or a public department. If the beneficiary is over the age um, of the majority, 
the holder can still be um, a guardian legal representative or public department, or it can be themselves. Now, when they do turn 18, there's now a three-year grace period for you to switch over um, from the parent being the holder of the RDSP to the child being the holder of the RDSP. You need to switch the holder over if the child is financially calm, if the child is financially um, able or is mentally able to manage their own finances. If they're not cognitively able to do this, we need to get a physician um, to prove this, and then the legal guardian, uh, representative, public department, or parent um, can still be the holder. So the next step is to contact a financial organization. Um, the RDSP, once you have your disability tax credit approved, the RDSP is just opened by completing a form at any bank that you wish, um, and they're also going to need your social insurance number. Um, the same applies for the grant and bond. There's forms that you fill out um, that review your income tax and your annual uh, income, and that will determine uh, your grant and your bond. So this is a list of all the financial organizations in Canada uh, that offer the RDSP. And just a quick note, you don't have to open your RDSP with the bank that um, you regularly bank with. Um, if you feel that another financial institution has better knowledge about the RDSP, um, you're welcome to go to them. It's just a matter of having the disability tax credit. That's all they're going to need. So benefits and contributions. Anyone is able to contribute to the plan. Um, obviously the holder, and then if you have maybe family members or friends that also want to contribute, they just need written permission from the holder. There is no annual contribution limit, but there is a lifetime contribution limit of $200,000, and you're able to make contributions up until the end of the year um, that the beneficiary turns 59 years of age. So in terms of benefits, money paid out as an RDSP will not affect eligibility for federal benefits, for example, the Canada Child Tax Benefit, the Goods and Services Tax Credit, Old Age Security and Employment Insurance Benefit, or ODSP Income Support. Now, all provinces and territories have announced a partial or full exemption of RDSP income and assets for the purposes of assessing eligibility for provincial and territorial programs and services. So ODSP benefits are fully exempt. As well, contributions to an RDSP are not tax deductible and they will not be included in income when paid out of an RDSP. So withdrawing money from an RDSP. There's two types of withdrawals that you can make from your RDSP. The first is a disability assistance payment. So this is a direct withdrawal, a one-time withdrawal, from the RDSP to the beneficiary in a time of need. The second, which is the more common um, type of withdrawal, is the lifetime disability assistance payment. So these are regular withdrawals, and they must begin by the age of 60, but they may begin earlier. And once started, um, the lifetime disability assistance payments must continue to be paid at least annually until the beneficiary passes away or the plan is closed. So the LDAP is determined by a formula um, that takes into consideration how much money is in the RDSP, how long the RDSP has been opened, um, how old the beneficiary is, um, as well as the income. So everybody's lifetime disability assistance payment is going to differ greatly depending on those factors. So this will not apply to everyone, um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, if you do have specific questions about this page in particular, feel free to contact me afterwards. But there has been um, a plan put in place to assist the disabilities that have shortened life expectancy. So beneficiaries with a life expectancy of five years or less 
will be able to withdraw up to $10,000 per year in taxable savings, subject to certain conditions. So this is including your grants and your bonds and your earnings. So in addition, beneficiaries can also withdraw a prorated amount of their plan contribution. So repayment of any remaining grants and bonds that were not paid into the plan within the preceding 10 years is not required until the death of the beneficiary. So in order to take advantage of this measure, um, if you're in the unfortunate situation where you need to, the plan holder must submit a request to the financial organization along with medical um, proof that the beneficiary does have a shortened life expectancy. So there has been some new legislative changes um, regarding the proportional repayment rule. Um, again, this was a result of feedback that we had received from doing these sessions, um, which we communicated uh, to the government in charge of changing and updating this program. Um, and it is still not 100% perfect, but this is definitely a great improvement um, than before, as you will see. So previously, under the former 10-year repayment rule, any grants or bonds from the preceding 10 years were to be repaid to the government if any amount was withdrawn from an RDSP. The RDSP was terminated, the beneficiary lost eligibility or passed away before the 10-year period. So now, under the current rule, in order to ensure that sufficient funds are available to meet potential obligations under this rule, the RDSP issuer is required to set aside the assistance holdback amount, and this amount is equal to the total grants and bonds paid into the RDSP for the past 10 years. So this is the amount that the government has personally put into your RDSP. So this rule came into effect um, January 1st of last year, and it requires that for every $1 withdrawn from an RDSP, $3 of any grants and bonds paid into the plan um, must be repaid up to a maximum of the assistance holdback amount. So depending on how much money you're taking out prior to the 10-year um, period, you're going to only be repaying a portion of what the government put in. Keep in mind, your money that you personally put into the RDSP is never, never touched um, and will never be taken back. It's just a portion of the government what they're putting in. The reason they have this in place is so people don't open an RDSP, put in a large sum of money, um, receive a grant and a bond on it, and then take the money out and use it for something not related to their disability. So just in general, this new rule provides greater access um, to the RDSP savings for small withdrawals. Okay, so this image here gives a nice visual overview of how an RDSP um, would look in an ideal situation. It's important to keep in mind that everybody's RDSP experience is going to look a little different, um, but this just gives you a visual um, of how it would ideally go. As you can see, you can open your RDSP up until the age of 60, and you can also make your own contributions up until the age of 60. You can receive the grants and the bonds until age 49. So then, the money in order to um, seek the full benefit of the contributions you've made as well as the government, the money needs to sit in the plan for 10 years after the last grant or bond is paid. So you can keep making your personal contributions into this tax-free savings account. However, it needs to sit for 10 years after the last grant and bond is paid. Okay, so finally, we'll talk about closing an RDSP. So grants and bonds that have been in the RDSP for less than 10 years must be repaid to the government if the plan is closed. The beneficiary loses their eligibility for the disability tax credit or the beneficiary passes away. So another um, recent improvement to the program is the rollover option. So this allows the proceeds or a portion of the proceeds from a deceased individual's 
registered retirement savings plan, um, reg registered retirement income fund, or registered pension plan can be rolled over completely tax-free into the RDSP of a financially dependent child or grandchild with a disability. So the amount rolled over, it does um, contribute to the 200,000 lifetime limit, and there's going to be no matching grant paid on um, the RRSP, RRIF, or RRRPP contribution. As well, there is a rollover option from REFP, um, Registered Educational Savings Plan. Uh, parents are now permitted to transfer REFP investment um, income on a tax-free basis to an RDSP provided the plan share common beneficiary. So, if parents opened an RESP for their child with a disability um, with hopes that they would attend post-secondary school, but in an unfortunate uh, scenario, the disability worsened and the child is no longer able to attend post-secondary school, the money from the RESP can be rolled over, again, tax-free into their RDS. So um, similar to the other rollovers, um, they will not be eligible for matching grants. Um, as well, the RESP uh, grants or bonds, they must be returned to the government. Um, and then contributions to the RESP. RESP will be returned to the subscriber on a tax-free basis. Okay, so... This is um, contact information. Um, honestly, this is one of the most helpful lines. Um, I personally have an RDSP open, um, and I've called this number many a time, and they are wonderful. Specifically, if you have questions about the grant and bond, you can call the top number, and then the RDSP, um, call the bottom number. However, um, if you have more specific questions um, or you require some one-on-one -on -one assistance um, and follow-up, this is my personal contact information. Um, at Compass, we are here to help you. We're able to come to banks with you to assist in application. We can assist in filling out the disability tax credit. Um, again, we have many years' experience dealing with the RDSP. So, um, if you have any questions or um, personal situations that you need some extra assistance with, I'm more than happy to help. And that's everything from me. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. Thanks, everyone. So that was great, Kate, and very informational. I know I personally learned a lot, just as everyone else did as well. We're going to... Um, so I'm going to share some resources here. You can see our web address if you want to um, look at any of the resources that Children Support Solutions has online. We've added uh, the Registered Disability Savings Plan fact sheet and the steps to open a Registered Disability Savings Plan. So they're both downloadable on our website now. Um, and then we also have linked a resource. Um, there's a, a great book that's called Safe and Secure, which is from Partners in Planning, which also outlines um, some different ways that you can, different financial supports that you can access. So we're going to move on to our questions now, and I'll just remind you that you can answer any questions in the bottom right-hand corner via the chat function, and we'll be answering questions. Well, Kate will be answering your questions, so we're happy to get started now. So, Kate, are there any frequently asked questions that you hear from parents? Um, the most frequently asked question that we hear is regarding the disability tax credit. This always seems to be the most challenging um, kind of portion of the process, the opening an RDSP. Um, so, one bit of uh, like a little tip that we give 
is when you're filling out a disability tax credit, which is a form you can find it online um, as well. I can email it to you or we can send a hard copy in the mail. But the most important thing to remember is attach all um, applicable information that you can, even if it means stapling a few extra pages to the back of the form, um, because this is showing the government um, why you deserve to have this credit. Uh, so although it does require a physician to fill it out and sign it, you can always attach extra notes and letters from nurses um, or other medical uh, professionnel that you see on a regular basis. That's great. So it looks like we have a question here. Can you see that as well, Kate? Um, so the question says, I, I would like to know the benefit of rolling REFP to RDFP versus withdrawing REFP when my child cannot attend school. So the benefit of rolling it over would be that that money could grow more um, regarding the age of the child and how long the plan has been opened. Obviously, Obviously, it's not going to be the best scenario for everybody's situation, um, but it just means that now the money in the RESP is, can be rolled over tax-free. So you're not going to be losing any of that money, and um, it can still grow in the RESP. Thanks, Kate. We had a question come through by email. Um, and the question is, can grandparents, other family members, or friends open an RDFP? So, um, only the plan holder and people eligible to be the plan holder can open the RDFP. Um, so that can be a parent, a legal representative, a legal guardian. Um, however, grandparents or other family members can always contribute to the RDFP. All they need is written permission from the plan holder. Great, thank you for that. Um, so another question we have here is, um, who is permitted to be the beneficiary of an RDFP? I think you covered that, but if we could go back through that, that would be great. So the beneficiary must um, be eligible for the disability tax credit, be under the age of 60, be a Canadian resident, um, and uh, have a social insurance number. I'm seeing a couple other questions come through now as well. Um, I'm not sure, Natalie, can you see these ones? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so we have one um, from Tracy. My doctor missed uh, filling out one page of the DTC, so um, you were denied. I've now been waiting several months to have it reassessed. Will my chances of being approved now be less due to the oversight? No. That's very unfortunate, and we also have um, a lot of sessions with physicians because we have heard a lot of them don't know how to properly and effectively fill out the form. However, you can reapply for the disability tax credit as many times um, as you would like. It's not going to lessen your chances. Uh, obviously, just to save you time, it would be great if it went through the first time. Um, but no, it is kind of a lengthy process. Um, as they do receive a lot of these forms, but your chances of being approved are not less. Um, another question we have, um, so if you have another student in your household, uh, it would be better to have them use the RESP. Uh, yes, if you have an able child with an RESP opened, I would recommend just using the RESP. Um, we stated uh, my daughter's RESP in 2009. We just received an official diagnosis that decreases her life expectancy drastically. Can we use the money to pay for equipment, et cetera, now without penalties? Um, you know what, Laura? I'm going to have to get back to you personally on that one. I don't know off the top of my head right at the moment, um, but I will definitely follow up with you. So I see um, a question, I, I 
that someone joined and was asking if there's any government funding for behavior therapy for children with Down syndrome. So I, I'm guessing that you're asking based on the government funding that there is for behavior therapy with children with autism. So currently there isn't any um, there isn't any funding, government funding that's specifically for behavior therapy for children with Down syndrome. And then it looks like there's another one for you here, Kate. So once approved, is there a retroactive payment back to when diagnoses were made? Yes. So you can go back. Um, for example, if you if your child has been diagnosed uh, since birth, but you just learned about the RDSP recently, um, you can go back to 2008 or 10-year period and be receiving the payment um, for all the years that your child was diagnosed. So you will just need to prove, um, obviously, their disability throughout those years through a physician. Um, but then you can be receiving a large sum of money when you first open the RDSP um, going back retroactively. So I see another question. Or oh, go ahead, Kate. Oh, no, I wasn't. I wasn't going to say anything, sorry. Oh, sorry. I um, I see another question here from Miranda. It says, what can happen to the government grants and bonds when the DTC expires before 10 years? What can happen to our money when the DTC expires before 10 years? And our son, is, our son currently only qualifies for the DTC from 2010 to 2016. So with some disabilities, um, you do have to reapply for the disability tax credit. Now, I don't see, I'm not sure what your son's disability is, but you should be able to reapply um, and be approved again as long as he's meeting the criteria still. However, if he does lose eligibility, the government is going to take back um, the grant and the bond that they paid in. However, your money that you personally contributed just comes back to you. Thanks, Kate. And then Tracy just had a follow-up question. She had asked a question about retroactive payment, and then she um, was just looking to know, is this based on another application, or is it done automatically? So if you are eligible for the disability tax credit, um, that's what I'm assuming the application is referring to, uh, then you the next step is just going into a financial institution. They don't set up the RDSP. Um, uh, they don't set it up uh, without you kind of going in and making that first step. So if you're not eligible or you haven't applied for the DTC, that's the number one first step, and then it's going into a financial institution. So no, it's not done automatically. Uh, the parent or the plan holder needs to uh, take the initiative and open it. Um, I'm I'm seeing one from Michelle. Um, if you get the disability tax credit, do you have to open an RDSP? No, absolutely not. Um, it's just kind of reversed. In order to open an RDSP, you must be eligible for the disability tax credit. There was one right behind that from Gemma that said, if your child was diagnosed with autism, can it be retroactive to their date of birth? It can only be retroactive to 2008 um, because that's when the RDSP started. So Tracy just thought, for, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to jump on Tracy's uh, question as well about the retroactive payment being automatic. So you do have to apply for that. Um, again, your financial institution will have the appropriate form. And uh, once you fill them out and send them in, then your payments um, begin automatically. So 
So we're just going to take the, the final questions, if you guys have um, anything else to throw out there. And while those are coming in, I just wanted to remind everyone that we, that we are waiving the registration fee for anyone who participated here. And that's the $65 fee, so you just need to mention funding webinar if you contact us. So we have our final questions coming in here. So I'll let you speak to those, Kate. OPEN was referring to the disability tax credit. For general, let me go up. And we, oh, um, so if your child is diagnosed with ESD, can it be retroactive um, on the date of birth? Uh, yes, the disability tax credit can, because it's been around for much longer. Um, but the RGSP only to 2008. I hope that clarifies that. And then there was just another question from Kat. If I contribute to my child's RDSP from 2009 to 2024, and my child is no longer eligible for RDSP anymore, do I have, do I have to repay all the grants in 15 years? Um, no. If it's over 10 years, you, you just receive um, your payment from the RDSP. Great. So thanks so much, Kate. This has been amazing and great to have all these questions answered. I know that um, we hear a lot of questions about the disability tax credit and RDSP, so it's nice to have someone with your expertise join us. So we just wanted to thank everyone and let you know that when this webinar closes, we want to host more webinars like this, but we want to know what you guys would like to hear. So when it closes, something will pop up and ask you what webinars you would like us to host in the future. So please let us know so that we can line those up for you. We really appreciate everyone joining us tonight, especially you, Kate, and have a great night. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks so much.